Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am super excited to bring you this episode with my dear friend, the magical, wonderful, ever so incredibly smart, Christina McGee. You have heard her on the podcast before talking all things kids, how to tell your kids that you're getting divorced, how to help your kids through the process, all things kids. Christina is has a master's in social work, and she is an internationally recognized divorce parenting expert, speaker, and author. She runs a co-parenting specialist training. I was certified by her very recently, and I can't tell you how much I learn from her every single time we talk, truly. Um, her book, Parenting Apart, How Separated and Divorced Parents Can Raise Happy and Secure Kids is one of the best. Please get it. Get it today. Do not hesitate. Do not pass. Go. Do not collect $200. Just get her book. Uh, in her book, she offers parents practical strategies for dealing with the real life everyday challenges of co-parenting. And whether she's speaking, coaching, or writing, Christina's goal is to disrupt the status quo and change divorce for the better by helping families redefine themselves in meaningful ways. And that is what this conversation is about today. It's about disrupting the status quo and disrupting the language that we use around divorce. Everything that you're going to hear in this episode, I am completely guilty of and am working myself on adjusting. So I don't want to hear you guys be like, but you say that all the time. I know. <laughs> so uh, this is this is new information for all of us. And it's really important for us all to shift the way that we talk about divorce, not just with our children, but with the people around us with our co-parents uh, and everybody else. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the one and only Christina McGee. Christina, thank you so much for coming back on and to talk about uh, the, the language that we use around divorce and co-parenting and raising these little humans and how damaging it can be when we use all sorts of words that we're going to talk about in this episode. Yes, ma'am. I mean, <laughs> it, it's a big conversation. It's a very big conversation. And um, I'm going to try not to pull out the soapbox. <laughs> oh, no, please do. Oh, please do. They're, <laughs> listen, they're used to me being on a soapbox. I don't know why we're worried, we're worried about you being on one. Um, so, um, so words, words matter. So um, you, I think, have been spearheading a bit of a a bit of a crusade in changing the way that we use the language of separation and divorce um, in the court system, uh, in front of our children, uh, among us. And I am going to cop you guys. So I don't want anyone see, being like, yeah, but you say like, yes, you're right. I have I have used all of these terms um, that we're going to break down uh, myself, and so I am working on shifting my language because I learn from Christina, um, and when I I just completed um, Christina's co-parenting specialist training, and so now I now she certified me, y'all. So she's she's the master. So. <laughs> Well, even I, who talk about this day in and day out, have to be very mindful of, you know, the way you say things and because words are really powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And I hear people, including my own children that say, ah, it's just words. It's just words, but words are connected to concepts, mm -hmm. right? And concepts 
really inform how we think about things, how we engage with things. And so I tend to be someone who, you know, tries to be very thoughtful about the words that are used, especially around this topic, because we're talking about redefining families. Um, the marriage ends, but the family needs to continue. And if we want to support the integrity of that family, uh, then it's really important for children's sake to really think about how we're talking about this transition. And even just talking about divorce as a transition, right, is a big shift. Mm, as opposed to a split. Right. Uh huh. Right. Okay. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, so one of the first ones let's, let's tackle is visitation. Mm, yes. That's one of those. It makes one of those cringe worthy. <laughs> yeah. That's like it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, right? It does every mm-hmm. single time. And you know what? I still hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. Your parents use it. I hear professionals use it. It's used in court systems. It's you see it in blogs and on, you know, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. So, so, the, okay. So let's, let's talk about why this is a terrible word to use. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious though, like you say it and I'm sure everyone's like, oh yeah. Right. Because you're not visiting your parent, right? right. That well, is your home. Children and parents should never feel like visitors in each other's lives. First off, let's Mm -hmm. just, you know, set that out there, but let's just unpack the concept of visit. Like what do most of us do when we have visitors, right? We entertain, we have a good time and it's pretty much understood that this isn't a permanent situation. It's kind of like, oh, we have this little bit of time together and it's temporary and it's fleeting. And what a horrible concept to attach to time with a parent. Mm. And so children kind of get this subtle message that the time that they have with one of their parents has now become very precious, become very temporary, not permanent. And children need to know that when the marriage ends, that they are going to continue to share life with each of their parents that they are still going to be an important and valuable fixture. There needs to be that sense of belonging and connectedness and terms like visit and visitation just undercut all of that Mm -hmm. for children. And so if we want our children to feel secure, to feel grounded and anchored in family, then we need to continue to promote that idea with the words that we use when we're talking about it. Let me ask you this. Let's say, for example, one parent has more parenting time. I was going to say custody, but we'll get to that word in a minute. <laughs> Let's say one parent really has more cust- more parenting time. Oh my God, look, it just fell out. Um, and like, it's a, it's a quote, 75, 25 split, right? And, and actually the time that they're spending with one of the parents kind of is a visit or it's mandated by the court that it is a visit, right? Are we, are we still, how, how, what, how does this affect how we talk about that? So from, from my perspective, mm-hmm. children's lives shouldn't be divided up by the hours and minutes. <laughs> the percentages, right? percentages. You know, and, like, yes, exactly. Here we go. We're going to calculate all the hours and minutes of our children's lives and we're going to divvy them up. I mean, I think that we need to talk about parenting time, regardless of how much time children spend under your roof, no matter how many hours are spent with their little head laying on a pillow in a bedroom that you've provided for them, it still needs to feel like a home, right? Like we really need to focus on the quality of the time, the points of connection that we create with children. And I really believe very adamantly that when we're talking about how time is spent, we need to be crafting parenting plans that make sense for kids. Yeah. Right. We need to start there. What was life like before the divorce? How are kids, you know, used to spending time with parents? What kind of activities are they engaged in? What are the realities of day-to-day life? And let's start there. Let's start there in terms of thinking about. Now, I will tell you that research shows that kids tend to be more well-adjusted when there's a more equitable time-sharing arrangement between households. 
that's what feels good for kids. But I will also say that every situation is a little bit different. And, you know, parents put all this energy into crafting this plan at the very beginning of this process. And six months down the road, well, things may change or a year from now, or what worked for a three-year-old is not going to work for a 13-year-old. And so building in flexibility, circling back and taking a look at what kids' needs are is really, really critical when you're yeah. engaged in co-parenting. Yeah. It's it, it's interesting because I, I I can hear people say, but... Right. So when we say that it's really important to look at how their lives have been functioning before the before the divorce in order to craft the plan that will work Mm -hmm. for them in divorce. So, you know, I hear a lot of of moms screaming right now, usually right. Stay at home moms. Well, he's you know, I have I do. 95% of the parenting, I do all the work in the house. I should have them all the time then. What do you say to that? So I say that may have been the way it was and now things have changed. And so you need to carefully assess what do children need to be able to have a supported and engaged relationship with each parent? Like what needs to stay the same and what needs to change. And certainly some things will need to change. Mm -hmm. Um, When I say, take a look at how life was before, that doesn't mean, well, if one parent was the primary breadwinner and was out of the house or was traveling and one, you know, it was agreed, one was a stay at home parent, that that's the way things are going to stay. There may need to be some shifts there Mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. And so you have to carefully evaluate that, but to say, we need to move forward with a 50-50 split because that's what's fair does a great disservice to kids. Like what feels fair for parents doesn't always feel so great for kids. And when we treat children's time as a commodity, they internalize that mm-hmm. right? and, yeah. and they have an increased sense of anxiety and they become very committed to the idea of trying to keep things fair, of trying to keep things equal. You know, before we got on, I was talking about in the, uh, in the documentary split up Yes, where Ellen Bruno revisits um, 11 kids about how divorce has impacted their lives as adults and teens. And one of the young women in there says, you know, she thinks of her time with her parents, like pie chart, you know, 25% there, 25% there. And she's constantly evaluating. Did I spend enough time with my mom? Did I spend enough time with my dad? Did I do it equally? Did I do it fairly? And lots of kids do that. But as parents, we don't know it. It's flying right under our parenting radar because they're not talking about it. They're just constantly in kind of the state of checks and balances. Yeah. Yeah. The fairness thing. I mean, uh, let's this, so this is another one. This is another word. So I'm going to just like highlight the words as we say them right so far we've, (laughs) we've covered visitation and so fairness fair. Yeah. Because when we focus on what's fair, right? Well, we have a 50, 50, we have a quote 50, 50, um, agreement, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's fair. And so, right. You're counting back and forth. It, 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 it's like the parents are talking about what's quote fair for them and the kids then internalize, Oh, I, my whole life has to be fair for my parents. Right. Right. And like Olivia says in, in, in split up, uh, it's, they internalize that to the point where she's actually viewing her life as a pie chart. It's, it's, it's tragic. It's well, even tragic. in the first film, you yes. know, Taya, who was probably like six or seven in the very first split film mm-hmm. talks how for her birthday, for her birthday, she, sometimes she would really like to have birthday at her mom's house and have a birthday party, but she wants to be fair to her father, you know? So even at a very young age, kids are catching on to this idea of maintaining this balance, not wanting to upset a parent, not wanting to hurt somebody's feelings. It's hugely stressful for kids and it continues throughout the rest of their lives well into adulthood. The other thing that happens is when kids get caught in kind of this trap of fairness, they learn very quickly to focus 
on other people's feelings and not their own. Like they literally don't know how to care for themselves. And that's one theme that really jumped out in this documentary is that so many particularly interesting young women were really struggling Mm. with this idea of caretaking for Mm -hmm. parents Mm -hmm. and not knowing how to care for themselves or even identify what they really wanted. Let's back up and just sort of um, revisit the, the, the documentary split. Cause we're, I think we're talking about it. Like we know what we're talking about, but maybe, <laughs> maybe they don't, maybe nobody told <laughs> nobody, everyone else is like, what the hell are they talking about? So right. the first one uh, we'll link in the show notes to podcast episode I did with Ellen Bruno about her, yeah. the, the first documentary split, which you were a huge part of, um, And so can you talk a little bit about the first one and then what the second one is? Sure. Absolutely. So my dear friend, Ellen Bruno, whom I met 10 or 12 years Uh ago, um, when she split from her children's father, she started looking for resources where kids were talking to kids and she came up empty handed. She couldn't really find anything. A lot of adults talking about divorce. There are a lot of books, but she really, because kids listen to kids. And she really wanted to represent and capture the voice of children throughout this experience. And so she set on this journey to create a documentary because she's a filmmaker where she interviewed 12 kids between the ages of six and 12, who all had families that had gone through divorce and really gave these children an opportunity to share from their perspective, how it felt. Um, And it's a beautiful powerful film. It's right under 30 minutes. Um, and it was created to really, to let kids know they're not alone. And there are no adults in this film. That's the, nope. the, the beauty of it is that like Ellen's not in it. Christina's not in it. Nobody's in it. It is just the children just kids. and it's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, along the way, what we found out, it was not only a great tool for letting kids know they're not alone. It was also a great jumping off place for parents and kids to have really meaningful discussions because a lot of times as parents, you know, we don't know what to say or how to say it or how to approach some of these conversations. And it's easier to talk about what's happening in a film, you know, Mm -hmm. what another kid said than necessarily what's happening in our family. And so it's, it's also been enormously beneficial that way as well as professionals have really embraced this film as an opportunity to kind of give parents a little bit of a wake up call. Yes. To how this is really feeling for kids. It's, I mean, it, it really, it, it's amazing. And it's so, it's so insightful. These kids are just so amazing. And, um, and some of it's very heartbreaking and you always recommend, like, if you're going to show it to your children, watch it first. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because number one, you're going to have a really big emotional reaction to it <laughs> that you shouldn't have in front of your children. And number two, it may not actually be appropriate to show your children. So you want to, you want to sort of view with caution, but it's really important. And so split up the teen years is a follow-up that mm-hmm. is not out yet. It's coming. It soon. will be very soon. Coming soon. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, we're hoping within the next month oh, um, God, it will be wait. released. It's in its final stages of production, but split up. Uh, so uh, the question that kept nagging Ellen is after doing split and sharing it with the world, she kept wondering if there was more to the story. Did these kids have more to say? And they did. So she did circled. They ever. Did yeah, they ever. Did they? <laughs> I have I have seen this movie, guys, and I'll tell you what. <laughs> they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The insight, the the heartfelt wisdom is just it's leveling, right? I mean, it's it really just is. so powerful. And so she circled back and she re-interviewed 11 of the 12 kids as young adults and teens who are kind of in the stage of launching, right? They're graduating from high school moving into college, becoming independent, living on their own. And what they had to say was just, it's fascinating. It's Mm -hmm. fascinating to listen to these kids talk, but very, it's very clear as I've been saying for many years, that divorce is a thread that runs through your children's lives. It is not a, 
an experience that, you know, once you get through the process and the dust kind of settles, that it's just over and done. It's not, it will impact the rest of your children's lives. The question is, how do you want it to impact your children's lives? Right. And a lot of that has to do with the choices that parents are making in the early stages and throughout the rest of their children's lives. Yeah. This is all, you know, I just did an episode that, um, released a a little while ago with, um, with Bella Duncan of a kid with Mm. two homes. Right. And it's this, it's very similar. It's her experience and it, and it is, it's a, you know, from the time she was three, now she's 23 and, and she's talking about this, that thread that you're talking about. It is so important for us to recognize that this is, this does get woven into the fabric of their lives. And there's not a lot of their lives that it doesn't impact in some way. Right. Right. Um, which is why when we talk about what's fair, right? So we were talking about split up and how that one of the children, Olivia, who's now a teenager, talks about this pie chart. And so I just wanted mm-hmm. to give some context um, to that. Let's talk about custody. What's wrong with the word custody and what should we be saying instead? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many things wrong with <laughs> you know, the word custody, Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. you know, children are not inanimate objects. Again, like, you know, we're not talking about dividing up grandma's China or the silverware or the, you know, large screen TV. We're talking about our children, children that we share a life with. And when we talk about custody, um, again, we're treating children's time with parents and the idea of family is a commodity that's got to be traded and divided up. Right. Um, and instead, I really encourage parents to talk about parenting time. You know, yeah. what's our parenting schedule? How are we sharing time with our children? How yeah. will we manage that between two households, two homes, two homes where they should feel a sense of belonging and connection two places that they belong? The family changes. And so instead of living in one home, you have two homes. Um, and even that even how we talk about those two homes, you know? So um, there was a book a long time that came out mom's house, dad's house, and that became kind of the new lingo. Mm -hmm. But even in talking about mom's house, dad's house, you know, sometimes that doesn't feel very kid friendly. Right. Right. Yes. We started, we started talking about it by the street name. It wasn't my house or his dad's house. It was, it was his house. They were both Mm -hmm. his house. They were just in different, you know, two houses, different locations. And so we, right. we just talked about the location name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's great. And there's lots of ways to do that. The apartment or the house, the red house, the blue house that give the houses nicknames. I mean, right. there's a, a lot of different ways. Locations are great, but really it's just about how do we convey to children that life is moving forward? I love this. in in our training, you talked about custody. One of the problems with using the word custody is that like, Really, the only other place in the English language that we use the word custody is about prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? like, <laughs> like, we don't talk about taking custody of an animal. We don't talk about, right? Like, right, right. right. It's like, no, no, no. There are prisoners and children. <laughs> it's just not cool. Yeah, no, not, not yeah. at all. Along with custody comes who's the custodial parent. Right. Right. Yes. Who is the parent that has possession? Which parent is the, you know, non-possessor? Non-custodial parent. Non-custodial parent, right? mm -hmm. Custodial parent, non-custodial parent. Gosh, how family friendly is that? There's so many warm fuzzies associated with those terms, right? (laughs) So loving. And it also sets up, I think, a lot of tension in a co-parenting relationship because what are the other concepts that are attached to that? You know, if you're the custodial parent, the better parent, the more important parent, the winner mm, versus mm-hmm. being the non-custodial parent who is the loser, the less important parent, you know, and that's setting up a really dangerous dynamic. And, and sometimes, you know, I'm going to circle back to a point you brought up earlier in the conversation about, you know, that there are moms and, and not that I'm wanting to make this a gender issue. However, it's a parent fair, that has a, a primary. Well, yeah. sometimes often, a, yes. you know, 
a, a parent who has the primary caretaking responsibilities does mm-hmm. more the day in day out with kids, right. right? Sometimes shoots themselves in the foot when they want to adopt this kind of language, because, you know, when you get into visit and custody and being the custodial parent, well, when that time becomes really precious, there's another thing that can happen, right? If kids think of that as really precious and really sacred time that's fleeting, they don't want to rock the boat, mm-hmm. you know? So you've got a parent who falls into the trap of being the entertaining parent, the Disneyland mm-hmm. parent, the parent that wants to have a fun time because who wants to mess up the little bit of time you have? And you have kids who are on their absolute best behavior, don't do anything wrong. They're an absolute angel. And then they come back to the other parent and it's like the wheels come off, you know, and, and then that primary parent, that custodial parent gets saddled with being the disciplinarian, the one that does homework all the time, the one that has to put up with all the meltdowns and deal with the issues and you have this dynamic where you have one parent going, I don't, I don't really know what your problem is. They're fine at my house. You probably just don't know how to parent them. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And so maybe I should have more custody since. Right. Of since course. That's they the behave answer. better with me. Right. I mean, it, yeah, exactly. And as our friend Emma Johnson talks about and has studied at length that this sets up you know, the, the, the quote custodial parent, the primary parent as, you know, not being able to advance as far in their career, not being able to get on their two feet because all of the burden of parenting is on them hundred percent. Um, right. And it's, and it's too much, it's too much for us to, to be able to move forward. Well, it's not good for parents and it's not good for kids for lots mm-hmm. of different reasons. Mm-hmm. And when we talk about, you know, Equitable time sharing arrangements were also talking about equal responsibility, you know, and that's another component to this conversation. Like you need to continue to be a family, not just in one home, in both homes. And part of being a family means sitting at the kitchen table and doing homework together and taking out the trash and having chores and, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sitting around in your pajamas and eating pancakes on Saturday. Um, and so if you want a parent who's not jumping into that entertainment role, you need to help them feel like they can continue to be a parent, that they can continue to be actively involved. And that can happen regardless of the time sharing arrangement, right? Mm-hmm. We can mm-hmm. still talk about both places being home. We can still act like a family. And, and that's also why I encourage parents to adopt what I call an on-duty and off-duty parenting model. Yes. Yeah. Talk more about that. That's um, because that's as opposed to custodial parent, non-custodial parent, it's my time. It's not my time, right? There's a parent who's on duty. You're always parenting. You're never not parenting, right? right? You're always a parent. (laughs) Always, always, always. Right. So that is that, that's what you refer when you say on duty versus off duty. Well, you're looking at parenting roles as not being static, but interchangeable depending on how you're parenting in the moment. So the on duty parent is the parent who is actually, you know, they're the ones making the lunches, doing the school pickup, sitting and doing homework, tucking kids in. Um, And the off duty parent is kind of on the sidelines they still continue to make meaningful contact, you call kids, you check in, find out how the day was. If something comes up and they need to jump in to help out, they can, but they continue to be a supportive figure and role in the parenting game. And then when the time sharing shifts, the other parents on duty and the other ones off duty, like you still have value in children's lives. You're still actively engaged in different ways, just like, you know, you would be on a football team, right? Everybody's not on the field at the same time. You've got some players on the sidelines, some that are in the game and they switch out with right. the ultimate goal of playing the best game ever. And it's the same with parenting. Yeah. So it's, it's so great. When we were, um, out of town when you were in, when you were into, well, whatever we were in Palm Springs. Right. And we had this <laughs> thing happening where I was the off duty parent because I was at a conference 
with my colleagues and friends and we're sitting at dinner and my, my co-parent, I was about to say my ex, but we're, that's another one we're shifting. Um, my co-parent was texting me incessantly about something that I had set up. It was a practice SAT <laughs> test, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, and I, and I was, and I was sort of, you know, God, I did all this. I set it up. All you had to do was show up. Blah, 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 right. I was getting so frustrated. And then I looked at you and I was like, I'm the off duty parent. I'm gonna, I'm the, I'm off duty. I'm off duty. Cause I'm at a work conference. And what I said to him, I'm sure you can figure it out. I set everything up. It's in your email. It is on the co-parenting calendar and I'm sure you can figure it out. I'm at a work dinner right now. Done. And you know what? He figured it out. And my son took the practice SAT the next morning. <laughs> Everything was fine. Fine. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to allow yourself to be off duty um, mm-hmm. and do it kindly. Right. Cause sometimes we get really angry, right. I used to jump in, leave the work dinner, da, 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 get all involved, make sure everything was fine, take care of it all. Right. But that doesn't help anybody. Mm-mm. Right. And most particularly myself, I'm with my, I'm, I'm at a work conference. I got, you know, I got my friends to hang out with and have dinner with. And, um, and also it doesn't serve my co-parent because as soon as I say to him, I'm sure you can figure it out. He does. And then he feels empowered and he feels like a better dad. And how great for your kids to see that. And you can have a life. <laughs> you can be at a conference and the yeah. world still spins. That's right. Right. And yeah. they can figure things out and their other parent can figure things out. But I, I think that part of that is also it's hard breaking out of those roles. Right. Cause we have this history mm-hmm. together. We had, it's kind of like a dance that we've done yes, for such a long right. time. That's right. Yep. And we yep. have to learn new steps. And, and part of that involves like stepping back a little bit or that's right. yep. giving somebody else an opportunity to step in. Yeah. And I talk about that a lot of like the transition from being a stay at home parent to a, to a shared, shared parenting time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the words just, the yeah. words just come out. Uh, but to having shared parenting in two homes, to when in the beginning, it was like, I did everything. It was my job. Mm -hmm. It was my job to do everything. And then when I, when I moved out, I did have to, there was a transition time where my co-parent was like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to, how to shop for birthday parties. I don't know how to, you know, and I was like, of course you do. Like, you're not an idiot. (laughs) Like you're a very accomplished grown man. And I'm Mm -hmm. sure you can figure this out, (laughs) you know? And I said like, and here's a tip. What I do when I don't know what to get a kid for a birthday present is I text their mom or their parent or their dad. I text the parents and say, Hey, what, what is, what is so-and-so like, what is he into right now? So that's that's what I would do. Such (laughs) an important point. And we talked about this, um, in the co-parenting course is that, you know, in the best interest of our children, it's a good idea to kind of figure out what roles we've each been filling and how can we help each other out? Like giving a tip. And now a word from our sponsor, the Divorce Survival Program. Now that you know that divorce is on the horizon, you need to get up to speed on how all of this works. Stat. You probably have a million and one questions swirling through your head from how and when do we tell the kids to will my ex and I ever get along again and just about everything in between. You've got legal questions, you've got financial questions, and you've got a whole host of questions about your kids. And that doesn't even touch how you'll start your life over again. Lucky for you, I have the answers to all of your questions. As one of the pioneers of the divorce coaching industry, I've been helping women navigate the divorce process for the last decade. And now, for the first time ever, all of my divorce wisdom is available in one online program. The Divorce Survival Program will help you process the emotional fallout of your divorce so you don't go into mediation bitter or resentful. It'll help you understand the difference between litigation, mediation, collaborative divorce, and identify which is right for you. 
It'll help you tell your husband you want a divorce in a way that doesn't keep you stuck in a circular conversation for the next three months. It'll help you tell your kids you're getting a divorce in a way that won't completely break them. It'll help you understand how your divorce will impact your friends and family and what conversations are appropriate to have with each. It'll help you create appropriate and healthy boundaries with your ex and learn about dating after divorce and how that will affect you, your kids, and yes, even your ex. But most important, the most important thing this program will help you do is protect your children from any unnecessary fallout from an ugly and contentious divorce litigation. And that, my love, is fucking priceless. So sign up today. Go to kateanthony.com slash getting divorced and don't forget to use the code DSGPOD for $50 off. That's DSGPOD, Divorce Survival Guide Podcast, because that's where you heard it. DSGPOD will give you $50 off. So once again, that's kateanthony.com slash getting divorced. And now back to our episode. And I love that we talked about in that awkward stage of you know, living together while separated and still trying to figure out all like, okay, who's going to keep the house and like, and like all of that. Right. But we're still under the same roof to utilize that time as like a training period. Yeah. Right. I think it's great. Hey, you know, I've always made breakfasts and gotten the kids ready. Would it be okay? Or would you like, since you're going to be doing that when we separate, would you like for me to show you what I do and how I do it. Yeah. And I think, I think that's an important piece to ask for consent around that. Right. Cause some people be like, no, <laughs> I got it. Thank you very much. Right. I don't need you to teach me, but there are things like that, that you, right. yeah. In the best right. interest of the children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you need to have a, a third person to help facilitate that conversation because in those early stages, there's like so much emotion and it's so easy to get caught in the trap of assuming or putting a little spin on what the other parent says, you know, like offering to show you how to make breakfast. What do you think? I'm an idiot. I can't, you know, right, when the right. intention may be very sincere and genuine and, and you know, in an effort to be helpful. Sometimes it doesn't come across that way. Sometimes it isn't that way. Sometimes it is totally, you are an idiot. (laughs) Sometimes there's some subtext there, but, but if you really make it Mm child-centered, right, you're going to have to be taking the kids to school. And I know this is something that you haven't done before, you know, or, and, or utilize the, the, the time while you're still under the same roof to share, start sharing parenting. Right. I mean, I really recommend that people kind of talk about how they want to do a timesharing arrangement while they're still under one roof. Yeah, me too. And try Mm -hmm. it out, experiment, and then come back and talk about, and, and to be clear, none of this is easy. None of this is easy. That's right. right. Yeah. Christina, we, you know, we talk about it, like you just say this and then, you know, it's, it's, Right. You've got emotions that are, that are spinning high, but, but it can be made easier by, as you said, having someone mediate the conversation or just to know that these are things that are options. You know, these are options to be able to say, okay, going forward, we're probably going to do a shared parenting arrangement. So how about we start to experiment with what might work while we're still under the same house and we can get, we can back each other up. Right. And especially if you have a parent that's really dead set on, it has to be 50, 50 and not a minute less. Yes. Right. I have even been on the phone in coaching calls with parents when they say, and we have to figure out how we're handling makeup time. If this person gets like, you know, three hours and 20 minutes extra, how am I giving them those three hours and 20 minutes back? And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, let's, let's back this up. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like, right. Did you engage in that behavior before you split up? No, you didn't. You just kind of rolled with it because you were parenting kids, right? Mm-hmm. Just because the marriage has ended, your children's mm-hmm. needs stay the same in that regard, right? They still need you to be parents. They still need you to show up for them. They still need you to find ways to work it out. Divorce shouldn't change that. That's right. 
so let's talk about the 50 <laughs> 50 conversation. We're just right. going to hit all my favorites. <laughs> I, that's right. That's why, that's why I brought you here, Christina. So yeah, 50, 50, 60, 40, 75, 25, 70, 30. What's wrong with that? Well, we're still going back to this concept of treating time with children as a commodity that gets bartered. It gets thrown in with everything else, right? So we have barter about um, what's fair. And the court system doesn't help out in this regard because in a lot of jurisdictions, you know, support is connected to how time is being shared. Horrible, horrible, horrible idea. Yep. <laughs> um, and I, I really recommend again, conversations need to start with what do we want life to look like for our children moving forward? Mm-hmm. Right. How can we work together to sustain and support two homes for them. Like, how will it feel for our children if there's like this huge financial inequity? Like Mm. one parent is really struggling to make ends meet and the other parent is not. Yeah. Right. What does it say to kids when mom has the house and, you know, dad's sleeping on a blow up mattress in an apartment somewhere with no furniture, Mm -hmm. you know, and, Mm -hmm. and it plays out lots of different ways. Sometimes it's the other way around. You know, mom is really strapped and struggling and having to get back into the workforce and dad's handing kids all kinds of gifts and, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's aspects to that, right? Because just from my own experience, right. I was the one who was struggling, 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 struggling. You know, my son would be like, can we go to the movies? And I'd be like, no, (laughs) we can't. And his dad made tons of money and it wasn't, you know, we were, we had been divorced for, uh, you know, a period of time. It wasn't his dad's responsibility to support me anymore in that way. And it was when I was building this business and I don't regret it, but you know, it was, there were rough times and, and it afforded me an opportunity to have conversations about money and finances that my son right. was not going to get from his dad because his dad was a spender and and all of those things. And he had, he had plenty of money. And so, you know, it was able for me to talk about budgeting and talk about, you know, this is how much it costs to run a household. And like, this is how we have to, you know, budget for things. And this is, and it, and it, you know, it really did afford me an opportunity to do that. Um, not in a way that made it his responsibility or put fear into him at all. You are given the opportunity to show your children to perhaps two different sides of, of, of a coin. And that's, I think that's okay. Right. Absolutely. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, there are a lot of, so here's the, the kind of silver lining. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There is one, I mean, yeah, you know, to divorce is that it provides you a lot of opportunities to really give your kids important life skills. Like divorce is not going to be the only challenge that's going to happen in your children's lives. Mm -hmm. Chances are pretty good that they are going to encounter lots of challenges Mm -hmm. throughout their lifetime. And the question is, how do we help equip them? Like, it's not about removing the adversity. It's about teaching them how to deal with it and sending them this message that, yeah, you are strong enough to handle hard things and and let's problem solve and let's have these conversations. And the truth is anybody's family, not just divorced families, not just single moms can fall on hard times financially. I mean, look at the world we're living in today. I mean, things are changing every single day. Right. So how do we prepare our kids? And so I'm certainly not saying that you know, one parent has responsibility to make sure that everything is exactly the same financially. There are going to be lots of differences between households, but I think how we embrace those differences, how we unpack them with our kids makes a big difference, you know, and it's not just going to be finances. It's going to be values. It's going to be guidelines. It's going to be consequences. It's going to be day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And so back to this sort of this 50, 50, 50, 70, right. The, the commodification of our children's time or, you know, the division and the, how do we have, so, so, I mean, part of this, like you said, the courts already start this, right. And attorneys, right. You, as soon as you go to an attorney, they talk, they immediately start talking about, um, all right, what's the, what's the custody split? And what's the, you know, percentages. And so how do we 
get out of that mindset and invite our co-parent into, you know, shifting that mindset and all, all of that. How you start the process has a really big impact on where you end up. And it's important to remember, and I, I, I want to put this out there that you can only control 50% of that equation. <laughs> when we talk percentages, <laughs> let's talk that one, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. only control your side of the fence, right? Right. You mm -hmm. can put all these things out there and for some, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? You may not have a cooperative co-parent. You may not be in a situation where you are dealing with a healthy stable individual. There may be, you know, some toxicity there that you have to factor in and, and deal with. Um, but I, I think from the very beginning, if you've gotten, here's, here's how I look at our responsibility as parents, as when you bring children into this world and you're in a relationship, you have a responsibility to do everything you can to have a happy, healthy relationship and provide you know, the best family environment you can for your kids. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. If you've done what you can, and for whatever reason, you can't get there, then the next option is to divorce with integrity. Yes. And so that doesn't mean duking it out in the family court. It means making child-centered decisions, putting your children in the center of this process and not the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's really fundamentally, that's what it's really all about. And so if you are struggling um, or you don't know how to get started, then that's where you get some support. And right. the vast majority of parents don't. Nobody goes into this planning. Well, when I get my divorce, right. <laughs> here's right. what we're going to do. Right, right. right. No. Exactly. No. We're in love. No. We're going to make it Everything. work. Oh, we're it's, gonna... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so- how could you be prepared? How could you be prepared yeah. for this? So mm -hmm. get some support. And that could be reading a book. It could mean talking to someone like you or I, mm -hmm. it could mean um, getting involved in the support group. It could mean going to therapy, getting yes. a counselor. I mean, all of the above, <laughs> any, of it, any, <laughs> right? any, anything, any, any and all, all right? any and all. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I think when we go it alone, yeah. it's harder. It's harder to know what to do. Some, some intuitively, you know, do a better job than others, but the vast majority of us, I mean, divorce levels, it, it levels your life, mm -hmm. you know, it upends everything, everything changes all at once. And that's a lot for any person to deal with. I mean, it's hugely stressful. It's a crisis in a family. So when you're mm -hmm. in crisis, you need some support. I think that's right. And, and it's very rare. I mean, this is where thing where the rubber meets the road and where it's is very hard, right? It's rare that both parents are going to at the same time go, okay, now, you know, right, now we're right. going to shift this to, you know, divorce with integrity or, you know, and so the best thing that you can do, um, in my mind as a divorce coach, right. Is to allow your co-parent time and space mm. to mm -hmm. process through their rage, their anger, their resentment, their, you know, blame, all of that stuff. Um, before even really like diving into that conversation, right? This is why the process takes so long. This is mm -hmm. why we end up living with them for so long before we, you know, find a new house, whatever, because because there's a there's an emotional process and grief, you know, the state they got to go through the stages of grief. Before you can actually come back together and go, okay, all right, I surrender. What do we have to do to make this right for our kids? <laughs> right. 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 And that's such an important point. Like more often than not, you've got two parents that are in very different emotional places. Mm -hmm. And, and typically one parent has already emotionally distanced themselves from the relationship, kind of gone through their grieving, kind of come to terms, a place of acceptance of this is how life kind of needs to move forward. And the other parents in shell shock, right? right. Just didn't think we'd ever get to that place. Um, and so you, it, it's important to realize not only what emotional stage you're in, but what is your co-parent in? And so how does that things in terms of moving forward, they may need time to rage. They may need time to kind of wrap their head around the fact that this is really going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, there may be a period of depression or sadness. And so how do you account for that? 
yeah, in your communication and, and how you move the process forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So important. So important. What's wrong with saying X versus co-parent? Why are we, why is it important for us to stop <laughs> using the word X, which is just going to be so hard for me because it's been 13 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, so let's, let's think about that. You know, X is like, we're Cut removing off. it. We're cutting it off. We're taking it out. You will always be the only parents your children will ever have. Mm-hmm. Period. Right? right. Yeah. And so we want to support that in the language that we use for our kids. You don't become an ex parent, you know. Right. And no matter how old your kids get, even when I've had parents say, oh man, I'm just holding out till my kids are 18. And then once they turn 18, I am I'm done. Out. And I'm like, uh-huh. yeah, guess what? Got a, got a little bit of news for you. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Christina says this with, oh, I was as a mother never, of older children. <laughs> you are right. never done. You never are never, done. ever done. Like those parts of your vows, when you have children with someone, those parts of your marriage vows till death do you part will always ring true. It's real. You will always share that connection. And so again, we're coming back to this idea. I think also the words that we use really influence our actions, right? And so if we're looking at this other person as being in it with us is being a valued person in our children's lives. Why would we call them an ex? Mm, mm-hmm, right. Versus a right. co-parent, a partner mm-hmm. in parenting. That's right. what co is all about. Like it's yes. sharing, it's sharing. And that's why I like that term much better. And I think there's lots of different ways. Also, we can kind of support that idea. Like, for example, in your phone, instead of having your, you know, your ex's name, have co-parent and have their name or when, instead of their picture coming up, have a picture of your kids. Right. That's a, As, that's a great, a great tip from our co-parenting training that I think is so amazing. Right. And <laughs> I'll tell you that I have, when my mother calls me, I have the, the ringtone for my mother is the like, do, 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 do. It's like a, it's like a ominous, right. And I, right. And so every time the phone rings, I keep forgetting to change it. Every time the phone rings, I'm already annoyed. <laughs> right? I'm already annoyed. And so when you have your co-parents or, you know, your ex, like your, your former spouse's picture come up and you see their face and you're angry, you're already angry when you pick up the phone. And so this, this tip that you gave in, in our co-parenting training to have your kid's photo come up instead of his face, somebody that you want to punch, like it's genius. I mean, it's genius. Truly I think those small, I mean, they're subtle shifts. But I think they're important ones. Yeah, I think Those so small too. small things that we expose ourselves to day in and day out, the words we're using, how we set up that relationship, how we associate, you know, what's right. the context of our association. Um, I just think it, it makes a difference. It makes a huge Absolutely. difference. Absolutely. I need to change my mom's ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Because I really think that like every time it's the phone, I'm like, what? You know, because right. And that's such a great example because think of all the things that really irritate us about the other parents. Like we're <laughs> or well, well, the other our parents. mothers. You know. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite sayings, it's it's either one thing or it's your mother. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh, Christina, thank you so much. Did we miss any? I I'm sure we did. We could probably talk for hours <laughs> about this topic. We could, or, and, and, and any other Christina McGee, where can everybody find you? They can find me at divorce and a and children.com. That's where I hang out. And I'm also um, on Instagram, catch me at IG at divorce and children or on Facebook 
at Divorce and Children. Yep. All the places, yeah. Divorce and Children. And uh, the most important thing is that everybody needs to read Christina's book, Parenting oh. Apart. It is, it is the best book on co-parenting that exists and um, everyone needs to read it. Parenting Apart. And what's the, what's the subtitle again? How Separated and Divorced Parents Can Raise Happy and Secure Kids. There you go. There you go. Happy and secure kids. That's what this is about. It is. I have a stack of your, I have literal, uh, an actual stack of your books on my desk. So, um, so, all right, Christina, thank you so much. I love and adore you as always. Uh, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.